Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd Road. Welcome to it, Depeche Mode, the podcast. I'm your host, John Justice. Glad you are with another episode again this week as we talk about all things Depeche Mode. As always, if you want to email the John Justice. The John Justice, J O N at gmail.com. The John Justice at gmail.com. Talk show nerd at gmail.com works as well. Um, MyNerdWorld.net. Uh, you can leave a comment up on YouTube. And I encourage you to follow me on uh, social media um, at The My Nerd World on Instagram and on X. You can also find me on TikTok at The uh, John Justice, and you can find me on Facebook at uh, John J or well, John J O N Justice on Facebook as well. So, news wise, there is not much of anything uh, to dive into this week. We're all anticipating uh, the continuation of the tour as the band returns to North America next week in uh, Mexico for uh, three nights there. Some rumors swirling, some contradictions. Some disagreements with regard to those rumors. We have some listener feedback. And then, since there's not a lot of news going on, um, myself and uh, my friend Matt, who I'll be seeing Depeche Mode with in uh, November in Denver, decided to do a little project this week. So I'm going to present part one of that project in the fan spotlight portion of the podcast this week. So let's go ahead and get into a bit of the rumors and what is being said currently about what may or may not happen in Mexico next week. And we'll do that via listener feedback. So again, if you want to email a couple of ways to do that, uh, the John justice J O N at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube. As I mentioned, um, see what nine, eight, seven, eight, uh, writes overnight. Are the rumors about the recording in Mexico still true? According to Depeche Mode Europe, the rumors seem to be false. Um, Museo Depeche Mode on X had posted something similar as well of the rumors of the band recording for a physical release Blu-ray DVD taking place in Mexico. Let me go back to the original rumors on here, and um, I don't have anything further on this. Depeche Mode Europe is now reporting that from what they know, the uh, tour is not being filmed uh, by Anton Corbin in uh, Mexico. So let's go back to the original rumor from a couple of weeks back, and um, I'll tell you what I know. I do not know anything uh, new beyond what I reported last week. There was a friend of the show that had reached out to the show with photographic uh, evidence and and more that he had the opportunity backstage to talk with uh, Peter Gordino. And actually, it may have been backstage, or it actually may, it might have been at a hotel. I don't remember. I didn't go back and look. Um, I do remember what it was he exactly said. He said he got into a conversation with Peter Gordino, and Peter had told him that, indeed, uh, the Mexico shows were the shows that would be filmed for the live physical release of the Memento Mori tour. Uh, The friend of the show actually mentioned, and this is where some wires may have gotten crossed. He actually mentioned that in that moment, he was disappointed because he forgot to ask Peter about whether or not Anton Corbin would indeed be the one filming the show. Okay. So we also have rumors, and Depeche Mode Europe on X said that this was true, that Anton Corbin was shooting a week in advance on the streets of Mexico for some European television special. Last week, I reported that information that was shared on X. I extrapolated that since I was told via Peter Gordino through this fan that this was where, in Mexico, the um, concert would be filmed for the physical release, that since Anton would be filming in Mexico on the street footage with the band and potentially fans, that it made sense to me these two things would go together and Anton would be the one shooting the footage for the live tour release. So that's all I know. I don't know specifically, and as I mentioned, the fan said that he was disappointed because he failed 
to um, ask Peter whether or not Anton would be the one filming the concert when Anton told him that Mexico would be the location where the concert was going to be filmed for the DVD and Blu-ray Blu -ray release. So I was making my own sort of informed speculation that since there was a rumor going around that Depeche Mode Europe has said is still taking place, that indeed Anton may be using that footage for the for the live DVD release. It's possible that these could be two separate things going on. That Anton could be filming something for a you know for European television, and they are actually filming for the live physical release of the Memento Mori tour in Mexico. But Anton's not the one filming it. It would not be the first time that Anton has, uh, hasn't has been the one who's filmed the live release. When you look back at uh, Barcelona, uh, when you look back at the tour for Playing the Angel, um, those were um, filmed by, by somebody else. So whether or not they end up using Anton on this tour, your guess is as good as mine. I think there are arguments both for and, and against that. And I don't know what it entails in filming a concert now. Um, you know, Anton did do the last one, but that was also part of the movie that they did for um, for Spirits in the Forest. So that makes that makes sense. Seeing as how the last release they did, now that I think about it further, seeing as how the last release that they that they did for the for the Global Spirit tour. And that was filmed by Anton and had the, the fan element to it along with the movie. You know, it would be rather redundant to go and do that again. So we'll wait and see. Um, a week from tonight, we'll at least know what the set list is for the show. Um, I'm not confident that we'll get confirmation unless people are there and they can specifically see if there is a film crew there to just film the show for a physical release. We already know that there's footage taken during the concert um, due to the fact that they use it for the, for the side screens. And so you'd have to be able to pick out whether or not there is extra filming taking place. So we'll wait to see. Like I said, Depeche Mode Europe says, according to their sources, it is not being uh, filmed for a live release. Um, I was told, you know, via this uh, f fan and friend of the show, uh, that Peter Gordino said this was a location. Uh, the Anton Corbin angle of it, I think, is completely up in the air. And that could be where the wires have gotten crossed. That Anton Corbin may be shooting something, but it's not going to be the live physical release, and they decided to get a different uh, a different director. So we'll find out soon enough. You know, For me, it's always just fun to speculate, and I appreciate the information that I, uh, that I get from you and you passing that along. So, um, all right, let's get to the next uh, listener feedback. Uh, DJ Sparkle Mike from San Francisco writes in, uh, says, thank you for reading my letter on the air. I was, I'm actually on vacation um, and said I would be reading your book when I first heard the letter read on the podcast, Driving from Roswell to El Paso. Haven't finished the book yet, but it's great so far. Uh, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Um, the reason I'm writing you is I stumbled upon the first ever solo album by Vince Clark. I thought you might be interested. I did see that I saw the release um, information for that solo album uh, by Vince Clark. I have honestly not gone and checked it out yet. Um, I like Vince Clark. I like what he did, obviously, with Speak and Spell. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the uh, in the show. I thought uh, the uh, record that he did, the album release that he did, VCMG with Martin Gore, was pretty cool. I dug that. Um, but I just didn't have any quick desire to run out and listen to Vince Clark's uh, solo album. But I'll probably ch I'll try to check it out between now and uh, next week's show. Um, Mike, also known as DJ Sparkle, goes on to say, also that uh, AI um, that you shared was insane. I know that it turned out it wasn't songs from Division, but they are absolutely one of the best bands ever. Give them um, a listen. Uh, best Mike again, also known as DJ Sparkle. Thank you for that, Mike. I uh, appreciate the listener um, feedback. All right. Um, Andrea, fan since 2017, writes in, thank you for suggesting the book Depeche Mode, every album, every song. Um, I buy every book relating to the band. Um, my favorite is DM by Anton Corbin and the monument, uh, the Depeche Mode and, and the monument book. The Depeche Mode Live will be available in English in 2024. We talked about that on last week's show. 
that the um, the authors that put together Monument are putting together Depeche Mode Live very much in the same way that Monument was. And that's fantastic news knowing it's going to be available in English in 2024. Uh, she goes on to say, thank you for the podcast. I listen uh, since I found it a few years ago. Again, Andrea fan since 2017. Uh, thank you for that, Andrea. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the um, the info. Um, Dave and Mart, I imagine not that Dave and Mart, but Dave and Mart write on YouTube, officially rehearsed songs for this tour that have not been performed yet. Uh, before we drown, well, apart from Strange Love. So before we drown, behind the wheel and Strange Love. We know that Martin Gore has done an acoustic version of Strange Love, although acoustic meaning on piano by Peter Gordino. I um was not the biggest fan of that when I when I heard it, to be honest with you. Uh, but according to Dave and Mart and uh, their comment on YouTube, before we drown, behind the wheel and Policy of Truth would be the other three songs that have been officially rehearsed live. When we get to next week and those three shows in Mexico, um, I think we're all waiting to see whether or not they freshen up the playlist. Um, When it comes to using those particular shows as the location for the filming of a live physical release, there's pros and cons against that. I didn't talk about this on last week's show, but I think on the one hand, it really depends on how the band feels about it. Um, You could make an argument that Dave and Martin having this amount of time off between these legs of the tour they'll be refreshed re-energized and ready to go three shows would give them an opportunity to capture a lot of film in one location to put together one complete solid performance i think there's also an argument going the other way that if they do end up freshening up the playlist that it could be a little bit rusty but i think you know three shows would be uh, clearly enough to get themselves back into the groove of things so like I said before, we will uh, have to wait and see how that uh, how that plays out. And I think we'll know, now that I think about it further, I think we'll have a pretty good idea whether or not those ended up being the locations, uh, the location for the uh, for the physical release. Um, I, I don't have a lot of confidence, by the way, that we're going to get um, much of a refresh playlist. Uh, I hope we do. I think a lot of people are hoping for uh, Before We Drown to be added into the mix and more Memento Mori songs, but that... Uh, that remains to be seen. Um, friend of the show, John, J-O-H-N, John Justice. I know he had posted on X. I think it was Museo Depeche Mode, but it, it might have been another account. They were uh, putting up sort of expectations for, you know, the playlist and whether or not the set list would, would change. And I know he put up uh, People Are Good, and I could not agree more. Yeah, I just... I get jealous, man. I see what, and I get it. I know I'm talking about two completely different artists here, but when you see Taylor Swift out, Taylor Swift out there doing 40 song sets, I mean, gosh, could you imagine? Oh, I would love to see that. I know this is this is where Depeche Mode are comfortable, and I know this is where Martin and Dave are comfortable in the shows that they do. They've been doing these types of shows now for four years. They've designed these playlists very specifically. Um, you know, and you know, your 19 to 22 tracks with your, your moment in the middle where Martin does his solo ones and, um, who knows what the future will bring, but man, you know, you see what some of these other bands have done and, uh, Metallica doing, you know, multiple nights and, and then doing completely different set lists on multiple nights. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I, you know, Depeche Mode could easily go and pull this off based off the popularity of this, of this band. But at the same time, you know, they've got a formula. It works. And for the most part, only us hardcore fans seem to complain. And I'm not even really complaining. I'm just adding in my, my own, uh, commentary. All right. Um, Russell Dilno writes, um, Like yourself, I'm a massive Depeche Mode fan, and I have been since 1981. I also play drums for a band here in Liverpool, UK, called uh, Crovelli Jacks. We've had our music played on some good local stations, and have recently had some great uh, feedback from uh, Alfie Agnew from Professor and the Madman. I wondered if if there's a chance you could play us on your podcast, if possible. No worries if you can't. We sound nothing like DM, but I feel our music is good, and I play it as regularly as I would other music from signed bands with a contract. The fact I'm playing um, on them is neither here nor there. I just like the songs. Anyway, 
Um, I sent you two songs we recorded fairly recently, hopefully going into the studio sometime again very soon. Thanks for taking the time to read this and perhaps listening to the tracks uh, also. Kind regards. Love your podcast, Russell uh, Dilno. And then he sent a picture with his, with uh, he and his uh, bandmates as well. Uh, I have one question, Russell, which hopefully you can uh, you can respond to. Um, I'm not going to play your songs on this particular show. Um, I did listen to them, and I enjoyed them quite a bit, and I would like to share them with the audience. Um, I'm reluctant to do so because uh, I get dinged so quickly with copyright issues. As a matter of fact, I got nailed on one several podcasts back. Not the AI one that I did, but there was another one that I did, and it was very, very obscure. Um, so the rules on YouTube are really, really strict as it re- as it relates to uh, music copyright. Uh, and if there's any label out there, regardless of, of big or small, um, that has the information out there, the uh, the AI attached to uh, YouTube grabs it pretty quick. So I guess my question is, if there's no fear, if you think there's no fear of getting dinged with a, uh, a copyright issue and taking the monetization away, I'd be more than happy to play uh, your music on the show. So just let me know. All right, one more listener feedback, and then we're going to dive into our fan spotlight this week. Uh, Gustavo um, Ayunta writes, maybe heaven can return as a Martin sung song. Talking about this on last week's uh, episode and um, the track of the single from uh, Delta Machine. That could work. Would not be one of my preferences by any stretch of uh, solo songs that I would like uh, Martin to sing, but I could certainly go and see that. My expectation would be very very low that that would happen but a good suggestion and thank you for the listener feedback all right let's dive into our fan spotlight this week i'm going to spend time with my buddy matt and i'll do mine next week so i'm reluctant to do this i don't think i I'm, i've probably talked about this before on the show but if i haven't i'll go down this road again uh being a massive obviously depeche mode fan also a massive Star Wars fan, and having multiple pieces of content to enjoy, people often go and put together their best of lists, right? The ranking of Star Wars movies, the ranking of Depeche Mode albums. That's really tough for me. Because a lot of this comes down to um, time of my life, situations that I'm in, However, Matt was encouraging to me, so I had decided to get into this experiment with him, an experiment we did. So the suggestion was simple. Why don't we compile sort of a comprehensive list of our Depeche Mode album rankings? So we did that over the course of the past two weeks. This week, I'm going to share with you part one. Part one is going to be my buddy Matt. Again, I'll be seeing him, uh, Depeche Mode, with him in Denver in November. Looking forward to anybody who listens to the show that happens to be going to the Denver show in November as well. Let me know. I'd love to do a podcast meetup uh, before the show or at uh, at the show, time permitting. So over the course of the past uh, two weeks, uh, Matt and I put together our definitive um, ranking of the Depeche Mode albums. We both went by our own rules without sharing with each other what the rules are. I'll share with you next week my rankings. I did two different lists. I did a list of the albums, basically an instinctive reaction. If the house was burning down, not even the house is burning down. I'm describing this the wrong way. But somebody just said, hey, what are the album rankings? Don't think about it. So I put together a quick list of the rankings of the albums, not really thinking much beyond sort of my instinctive reaction to them and maybe a little bit of nostalgia. Then what I did was I compiled a comprehensive list of my ranking of Depeche Mode albums based off of a points system. And then I had to adjust and weight that point system based off the number of tracks on the album and then did a a comparison of the two between my instinctive reaction and what my point system ended up listing the ranking of the albums as. So I will share that with everybody on next week's show. So for part one, we're going to go through my buddy Matt's list. And he writes, Amigo, let's have some fun and rank DMs and studio albums top to bottom. Here were Matt's rules. And I encourage anybody that wants to send me along your list, maybe we can... Continue to share this on future episodes as the tour uh, cranks up 
uh, once again starting in uh, in Mexico. So Matt's rules were speak and spell doesn't count for me. That's a completely different band, and I don't think it's fair to include it in the rankings. People are people, and other compilations do not count either. Proper studio albums only. For my list, I'm going to further break down the rankings into tiers, and I love what Matt did here. The Alan Wilder area, uh, era, the non-Alan Wilder era, uh, era. You'll quickly begin to notice that I'm an Alan, an, an Alan Wilder fanboy. Proud of it. In my opinion, what the Wilder era is on a completely different level than the rest of DM's catalog. He then went and used my scoring system after I shared it with him um, and listed it for each album. So here we go. So tier one is the Imperial Era, as Matt calls it. So Celebration got a score of 9.5. Any album that contains Black Celebration, Fly on the Windscreen, Question of Lust, Stripped, Here is the House, World Full of Nothing and But Not Tonight, is going to be number one all time for me, hands down. This is DM at their absolute best for me. Martin had to come into his own as a songwriter, and the band would still be experimenting with sounds and samples, but without sacrificing the melody. The album is dark, moody, and sexy, but with plenty of catchy hooks and timeless lyrics. It's everything I love about DM, an untouchable masterpiece. Music for the masses. The score was a 9.5. This album is a very close second for me, though it remains in Tier 1. I actually think the production, instrumentation, sonics, and vocals on this album are better than Black Celebration. Never Let Me Down, Sacred Strange Love Behind the Wheel to Have and to Hold, Nothing in Agent Orange, What an Embarrassment of Riches. And I absolutely love the sonic palette of this album. Choral, gothic, massive, and anthemic. What a combination. I never tire of listening to this album. Music for the Masses is a more mature and confident body of work than Black Celebration, but I still give the nod to Black. You are never you never forget your first love, right? Then we get into Tier 2, The Violator Era. The score, 9.3. I can't add anything to the review of this album that hasn't already been said. I love it and remember exactly where I was when I first heard each track on this album. It was a very special time in my life, and the tour was the best I'd ever seen. I saw them back-to-back nights at Red Rocks. Night to Reb opening. Amazing. By the way, where do we land on that? Do we go Nitzer or Nitzer? I've always said Nitzer. Uh, Nitzer. But I've heard other people say Nitzer. Where do you land? And DM's set list was perfection. I got backstage, hung with Martin to boot. That live music experience will never be topped. Heresy not to include this classic album in Tier 1? Maybe, but just can't do it. It comes in third only because this is where my secret band became the world's band, and therefore it gets a demerit. I like to zig when others zag. Not DM's fault. It was a bittersweet moment for me when the guys on my varsity soccer team, I was an athlete but not a jock, came up to me and said, Hey, that band you love, Depeche Mode. I really like that Personal Jesus song and the Silent Song too. Sigh. I knew right then that my band was no longer just mine, but I was psyched that the boys were finally getting their due. Like I said, bittersweet. You know, it's so funny because I got a buddy of mine, uh, one of the few people that I've remained friends with for this long in my life, but he was um, my best friend during this this era, um, leading up to the release of of Violator. Uh, And we were massive Depeche Mode fans, um, and we kind of discovered them right around the same time. So we were, you know, sort of early in the infancy of our fandom, having discovered Black Celebration on the backside and then leading into Music for the Masses. Exactly the same thing happened with with Mike. Um, When Violator came out and rocketed to the top with so much success, uh, he felt the same way, Uh, was disappointed that the band that he kind of had held to his own it was his own little secret to become popular and he actually you know um kind of stopped being a fan from that moment on did not get into songs of faith and devotion and kind of fell uh fell out of uh, a love with the band just interesting that was not the case for me whatsoever while violator comes in third as a consolation prize i give this classic work its own tier It's an all-time great album, just not as beloved for me as Black Celebration and Music for the Masses. However, if you put Dangerous on this album, it instantly jumps into Tier 1 for me. You know, I... Boy, you know, I would... Yeah, Dangerous is good. 
It is. I was thinking Sea of Sin tops it, but it really, but it really doesn't. Sea of Sin, happiest girl and dangerous. I mean, can we? I mean, talk about B sides. Can we get three better B sides than those? I mean, really, just fantastic songs. All right. Tier three, the rest of the Alan Wilder era. Some great reward, 9.1. For me, this album represents when DM found their sound and style. The SGR is a bit raw and immature. Its sound was to be refined later in Black Celebration and then perfected in music for the masses. But some great reward is still wonderful. Highlights, people are people. I don't care, Martin hates it. It's a banger. It's unique, and the production is incredible. It doesn't matter. Amen to that. Lie to me if you want. Miss you so much, Alan Wilder. And Blasphemous Rumors. Not a masterpiece, but oh so satisfying. And The World We Live In and Live In uh, Hamburg solidified my love for this band. I watched it constantly before 101 came out. I was absolutely obsessed. Songs of Faith and Devotion, 8.8. This is a great album, but it also marks the end of my favorite DM era. I dig the album's darkness, but songs like I Feel You took the band in a direction that I understood but didn't love. This album signaled a fork in the road for me. DM took the path veering away from their prior albums and styles, never fully to return. I respect the creative integrity, but I prefer drum machines and and synths to live drums and guitars. So I have mixed feelings about this album. Highlights for me, though, In Your Room, the album version, Walking In My Shoes, Mercy In You, Judas, Higher Love. P.S. Why in the world did DM not put my joy on this album? Mistake. Could not agree more. Matt and I have talked about this. Again, one of the best B-sides ever. Construction time again, 8.4. Even though this album still contains some elements of the sing-songy pop band that was DM in their early days, and it's a bit too fascinated with samples at the expense of melody and songcraft, I still love it. Highlights for me, two-minute warning, the landscape is changing, and then, and everything counts as a masterpiece. This album pointed what would Uh, What was to come was some great reward and holds a special place in my heart. All right, so now we get into tier number four. The best of the non-Alan Wilder era. Ultra, score 8.9. After Songs of Faith and Devotion, Alan's Departure, and Dave's Troubles, I was worried about my band. Ultra erased all those doubts. When I first heard It's No Good, I got goosebumps. This was my band again. Dave's vocals on the love on uh, the love thieves and sister of night are nothing short of incredible home was an instant classic and probably Martin's last great ballad. In my opinion, free state is a hidden gem and insight is everything I love about DM. Such a good album. My boys are back. This is where we deviate a little bit uh, free state. Just I, that song never, ever grabbed me. Um, I'll listen to it. I not quite skippable, but it just for some reason that song just didn't didn't land with me. Sister of Night, um, I adored that song as as well. And the backstory on that and how Dave was still dealing with his addiction at the time when, when they recorded it to the point where that was the only salvageable song from the first uh, series of uh, the first re- uh, session of recording. Uh, and they actually had to piece together his vocal performance to uh, create the song itself. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable because you cannot tell in listening to it. Uh, but that backstory always made that song bittersweet and a little bit more darker and, and um, added something unique and special to it uh, that it didn't necessarily need just because of how it sounds, but uh, still a fascinating backstory on it. Memento Mori, score 8.6. Yes, please. The last five songs on this album are as good as any five consecutive songs on any DM album, which says it all for me. Memento Mori is a remarkable piece of work at this stage of the band's career. I like it, but don't love the first side of the album, Ghosts Again notwithstanding. That's the only reason this album isn't ranked higher for me. And this is where, in my list, and I'll get into this next week, I got a bit tripped up. Not tripped up, but Memento Mori is such an interesting release from the band. Because I do give it extra credit for being as good as it is this far into their career. And when you go and try to compare previous albums, you know, there are there are other albums in the band's, you know, history that aren't as good or creative as Memento Mori, but the nostalgia factor to it and how it just is classic Depeche Mode is hard to overlook. Memento Mori, as I've said from the beginning, since I got the 
the advanced copy of it, you know, until, you know, now half a year into its release and it still gets almost a daily listen in one way, shape or form. It is wholly unique in and of itself while still being Depeche Mode and hearkening back to some previous works. Um, I'm looking forward to getting time away from Memento Mori, or should I say more time passing, and then seeing how the album settles in for me on a nostalgia level, like all of them do. Uh, but I really do love love that album, and it placed higher on my list than uh, than Matt's. Um, but our lists are very similar, and as I mentioned, I'll get into mine next week. All right, Tier 5, the rest of the non-Alan Wilder era. Don't get me wrong, I still like these albums, but the standards set by my top eight are so incredibly high that it's hard not to be critical of these works. And really, the order of the albums outside the top ten could easily be rearranged. They are all about the same for me, although Delta Machine and Spirit will always be dead last. Surprisingly, when I revisited it, Exciter fared better than I would have guessed. And Exciter's got a special place in my heart because that album is is central to the time when I met my wife, we got married, we moved, went to several of the shows together, getting into further into my radio career. And again, I'll talk about this on next week's episode when I go through uh, my list. A Broken Frame 8.1. Uh, I love this album's naivete and youthfulness, but it's certainly not Martin's best collection of songs. You could tell that he had not yet mastered his craft. Better things to come. But The Sun and the Rainfall is a masterpiece. For me, this song still holds up with the very best of DM's work and keeps this album in the top 10. Playing the Angel, score 7.6. I love this album when it was released, but it hasn't aged as well as I had hoped. Good, not great. The sonics of the album are less interesting to me and would be continued for several albums to follow. I agree. The same dirge was used in parts of Delta Machine and Spirit. Not a fan. And this is where Alan Wilder is really missed. To have and to hold in my joy are DM dirge songs done right. Without Alan, the songs like The Sinner and Me, Lillian, etc. suffer and not so well. I see what you did there. Like all DM albums, PTA contains some absolute gems. See nothing Nothing's impossible. And see, that's a song that doesn't connect with me at all. Interesting. But overall, and in hindsight, the album, it's an album that could have been better. Great tour, though. Um, Great tour. Playing the Angel, and again, getting ahead of myself, I'll talk about it more. Um, That album's tough for me because there's a lot of memories that I want to forget attached to that album. And I need to figure out a way where I can recenter it in my life and spend time with it. Uh, I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the time. Uh, that part of my career was really volatile before I got into talk radio when I was still doing talk radio, and it wasn't the best of times. And unfortunately, that album came out right in the center of it. So when I hear it, I'm reminded of those times, and I need to need to figure out a way to, um, to again, replace that in my life. Churches, and I love Churches, but um, Screen Violence is another album that um, I absolutely love, but man, I have a hard time listening to it because when it was released a couple of years back was the start of a lot of difficulties and probably the hardest time that I've ever had in my life. Um, Yeah. All right, let's move on. Exciter, score 7.4. I don't listen to this album often, but upon a closer look, it fared better than I would have imagined. I'm actually surprised that it beat out the other three albums. But that probably says more about those other albums than this one. A few great songs on this album, I Feel Loved, I Am You, absolutely. And a few not-so-great songs, Free Love, Shine, Dream On, When the Body Speaks, and Goodnight Lovers. You know, Martin's um, writer's block on this album was pretty apparent. The songs, just especially Shine, I think Shine had a lot of potential, but just was not fleshed out. A few that I don't care for at all, Dead of Night, Comatose. See, I love Comatose. And I like Dead of Night for just how over the top and sort of cabaret and just comical it is to a certain point. Overall, Exciter is a mixed body of work. Some good songs, uh, but not well executed. It's downfall. I never thought I'd say this about a DM album, but Exciter is too digital in my opinion. It lacks the warmth of prior DM albums. Maybe I'm just an analog Sith junkie. In any event, Exciter is just a bit off for me. You can do better DM. Sounds of the Universe, score seven. I wanted to love it, I really did. And when it was first released, I was in. 
But with time, the glow of this album has faded a bit. In Chains, Fragile Tension, In Sympathy, Perfect, all good songs, but they are missing the it factor for me. The rest of the album mixed. DM lost their way a bit here. Although sonically different, I put wrong in the I Feel You category, not the version of DM that I love. Give me more Ghost, Less Wrong, and Hold to Feed. Hold to Feed might be one of my least favorite DM songs ever, to be honest with you. I've tried hard to love that song or like that song, and man, I just, lyrically, the video for it just can't, just does not work on any level. All right, down to our last two. Delta Machine, score 6.1. Again, I wanted to love it, right, Matt? Writes Matt. But if I'm being honest, I have to say, meh. Welcome to my world, solid, broken, and alone. Good, but I wanted them to be great. My favorite track is actually the Gone Penned B-side happens all the time. I feel like this album was a missed opportunity for the band. The demos were very promising, but the production and final mixes took a wrong turn somewhere. You put the the Oli mix of heaven on this album and stick to the vibe of the demos on some of the others. And suddenly you've got a very, very good album on your hands. Instead, we got a mix of bluesy and monotone tracks and aren't that memorable for me. They don't have the DM magic. Alan Wilder again. Instead, we get a mix of bluesy. Oh, I'm sorry. I just read that part. Um, Alan Wilder. Again, you are missed. Delta machine ranks all the uh, tracks. Sorry, been a long day. Delta Machine's tracks all have the same sonics and too much dirge. These songs need a spark and some lightness. Think uh, the chorus and strings of My Joy, which was grungy but still super melodic. Again, miss you, Alan Wilder. Overall, too repetitive or too bluesy for my taste. As a result, much like Exciter and Sounds of the Universe, Delta Machine is an album that I don't revisit often. And when I do, I hardly l- ever listen to it front to back. And then Spirit, score six. I love Depeche Mode, but I'm not a fan of this album overall. Going Backwards is good, but not great. Where's the Revolution? I really can't stand this song. Trite, catchy in all the wrong ways, and too political. Just not my DM. No thank you. Favorite tracks cover me. So much love. No more. This is the last time. But they are not good enough to save this album. Again, the Dirgy Sonics do no favors for this album. Thank goodness Memento Mori came along to right the ship next week i will share with you uh my scoring and thoughts and ranking of the dm albums but what about you if you want to share with me feel free and get as detailed or undetailed as you would like just make a list or be comprehensive with errors like my good friend uh matt did hello this is martin and i will share share them on tomorrow's show hit the wrong button i record the show for live so That tends to happen. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast, as always. Again, if you want to email thejohnjustice, J-O-N, thejohnjustice at gmail.com. Leave a comment up on YouTube as well. And as always, if you want to support my nerd world and you enjoy science fiction, I hope you'll check out my science fiction space opera series set in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture. I was inspired by George Lucas and the storytelling of George Lucas and James Cameron. I love space operas, and I wanted to make my own version. So book one is essentially a mashup of some of my favorite movie genres, disaster films and science fiction action space operas with a little bit of romance. Of course, I injected Depeche Mode into the storytelling without being too obvious. Life in the so-called space age, the world we live in, life in general. The protagonist, Taft Guardia, in the book is a massive Depeche Mode fan when it's set in the future and the music of this era is nostalgic and popular among the characters. I included a bunch of Easter eggs, both direct and indirect, into the storytelling while attempting to create an exciting science fiction space opera adventure. So again, if you like science fiction and you like a little bit of romance and a lot of action, Embark is perfect for you. Written for adults, but great for ages 11 plus. Seven books at all in the series. Available in ebook, Kindle Unlimited, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook. Go to Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net. But if you go to Amazon.com, just search for Embark and John J.O. Injustice, you'll find it there. 
So again, this is how you can go and uh, support the show. I don't do Patreon or any of that kind of stuff. Thank you so much. Look forward to hearing from you between now and next week. And as always, I hope wherever you are, you are happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. Talk to you then. Bye. And now we'll hear from Martin and Dave. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garth from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to... My 